name is Patrick Griffin. I'm the director of the Keo Non Institute for Irish Studies at the University of Notre Dame. I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series that we've called Transatlantic Conversations. This is a collaboration between the University of Liverpool's Institute for Irish Studies and the University of Notre Dame's Keo School for Global Affairs. And this series will say what it says on the proverbial tin. It will foster transatlantic discussions on the island of Ireland at a critical moment. Well, if you're reading the newspapers, Ireland is back in the headlines. Brexit has resurrected dormant questions of Ireland's future. We see some sporadic violence that conjures images of the trouble and of troubles and of the past. We hear calls for the unification of the Ireland or the copper fastening of the union. We see parties and institutions struggling. We know that people are asking also for the US to get involved. On the one hand, we fear what is happening, but for every moment, uh, we also know that opportunities potentially abound. Maybe fears are overblown. Maybe we have to attend to reinforcing what the Good Friday Belfast Agreement calls for. Maybe this is a moment of possibilities. A few things are clear. Issues are as complex as they are urgent, and we need to have open and honest discussions of many tangled questions. At this key juncture in the history of the island of Ireland, this series is designed to foster conversation and collaboration between stakeholders in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, the UK, and the United States, all of whom have an interest in, a passion for, and a stake in Ireland's future. By stakeholders, we don't necessarily only mean academics, though there's gonna be some of these involved, that's for sure. Transatlantic conversations calls on the expertise of civic, political and business leaders to share their views and visions of need for strengthening relationships within Ireland, with Britain and with the United States. We aim for balance. You will see people in this series with decided opinions. Differences may well appear stark. This is fine. Transatlantic conversations is a forum for people with different perspectives on the islands, of, on the islands future. Above all, we aim for what the Good Friday Belfast Agreement suggests must be at the heart of Ireland's future, dialogue. And as well as different perspectives, I also expect you will see some surprising, surprising conjunctures. Today, we have a distinguished panel to kick us off. Panelists will be asking us to consider a number of topics that go to the heart of the aim of the series. What has Brexit done to the island? Is the deal between the UK and the EU imperiled at this moment? What is the protocol and why should we care? There will parenthetically be a number of terms of art you are going to hear. Has the peace process been working? How do we foster peace, interdependence and economic development in the midst of political flux? And what role can the United States play in all of this, political and economic? In short, where are we now and what does this all mean? And how should we make our way through so many tangled thickets? Well, you've heard enough from me. I'd like to introduce you to our first panelist, but before I do, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sure many of you have questions. I encourage you to hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. As soon as our panelists finish, we'll start introducing some of those questions and seeing if they can provide some answers for you. So without further ado, our first speaker. Our first speaker is Peter Sherlow. He's the Blair Chair and Director of the University of Liverpool's Institute of Irish Studies. Pete has undertaken conflict transformation work in Northern Ireland, and he has used that knowledge in exchanges with governments, former combatants, and NGOs in the former Yugoslavia, Moldova, Bahrain, and Iraq. Lots of interesting places, to say the least. He has also presented talks to members of the US Senate and the House of Representatives and is a regular media contributor. I turn it over to you, Pete. Thank you very much, Patrick, and welcome to everybody, and especially to Patrick and his team for organizing today. I have a very unenviable task. I'm from Belfast, and I've been asked to speak for only 10 minutes, which is virtually impossible. 10 minutes is usually a sentence for us, but uh, I will do my best. And just a few points, just to reiterate what uh, Patrick has said. This is a journey we'll go on with the Institute, um, Hugh and Otten. And uh, very much at the center of this is how do we build uh, that most important line to me in the Good Friday Agreement, parity of esteem and mutual respect. And, and how do we do that in a way 
which shapes and builds a, a future which does not just have parity of esteem and mutual respect as rhetoric, but we have it as practice and we has it, have it as significant change for the betterment of, of all of the, the communities that live on the island. What's important, I think, sometimes, is, and Patrick's referred to the recent violence that took place in April, et cetera, is sometimes you forget how successful this proce peace process has been. And that's one of the things I want to do by, by going through uh, some data and some information about the new society in which we live. And I think that's important because many times the reaction I get from my American friends when they see in CNN that there's a riot in, in, in Belfast is that somehow we're going back to war. And I think given the, 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 the success of our post peace process was the involvement in it. And one thing we have done recently at the Institute in the last 10 years, we have mapped nearly 20,000 inter-community reconciliation projects across the island. This is a very successful peace process. It's a peace process which will have its bumps. It's a peace process which will have its difficulties. But nonetheless, it is a peace process that has sustained new identity dynamics, new economies, and new ways of, of working and living. So before I move on to my slides, what I am uh, trying to encourage here is, is let's just be cautious when we see violence and let's understand where we've come from. Let's understand the protocol and Brexit are difficult issues, but we've gone through much worse and achieved much more. So overall, what we hope for in transatlantic civic space is how we get beyond the binary, how we get beyond identity politics and how we actually start to have evidence-based conversations which will facilitate the future. So, so, so what uh, the, 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 this talk today is really about is let's talk about the next generation of the peace process, which is about building the economy and delivering the peace dividend, which is critical to sustaining changes socially, politically within our society. So the first slide, I, I just thought this would be uh, a, a, an interesting uh, point to make. So, so the conflict in Northern Ireland, here's the data on who on many people died, how many civilians died, how many were imprisoned. And I thought it'd be interesting when you understand you know, the, the, the trauma and, and, and the, the, the animosity within our society about the past, about the issue of legacy. If we scale that up to America, we'd be talking about over half a million deaths, four and a half million people in prison, 9,000 people forced from their homes, and around 11 million people injured. So although it's a, the, the numbers are low compared to other conflicts, let us not realize this was a very intimate and very harmful and very traumatizing environment that we once lived in. Thank you, Catherine. One of the things that's also important to understand is just how violence has fallen. And, and you'll see in this graph, uh, I've put on some markers here. 1971, Northern Ireland Housing Executive, the largest ever social housing project in any society in Europe, which took away the whole question of discrimination in housing. 1976, we began the process of Fair Employment Act. And you can see that as we built institutions and laws for equality and parity of esteem, how violence in our society began to fall. And of course, when we get to the ceasefires, and then we move to 1998, and we move after that period, violence has virtually disappeared. But that's not what we hear in the media. That's not what we hear in our conversations. This is a massively transformed society. And you can see there in shooting incidents, 1972, there were over 10,000 shooting incidents in Northern Ireland. In the same year, the police seized 20,000 kilograms of explosives. Last year, they seized one. So, so this is an important piece of evidence. If we move on to the next slide, because with that violence, what we also led to were significant shares of deaths across our society. But yet again, you can see that the trajectory from the 70s has been generally downwards. And since 1998, marked here in red, that level of violence has virtually disappeared. So let's, so, so let's not have these weird conversations that this is a society that wishes for violence. This is a society which loyalists signed up to the Mitchell Principle. This is a society which Republicans signed up to the Mitchell Principles. This is a society which the two states in America helped forge the post-conflict society in which we live. Thank you, Catherine. One of the things that's happened in our society was obviously the question of policing. And here you can see very clearly in the, in, in, in the transformation of policing, the Good Friday Agreement gave us. You can see here that in both communities, there's been a significant growth. Over 70% of Catholics and Protestants now have confidence in policing. This is critically important. It's when you build institutions, when you reform society, it has very positive societal effects. Thank you, Catherine. 
Well, one of the things we do in Liverpool University is at each election, we ask people a series of questions about the future of our society. And it's interesting here when we look at 18 to 39 year olds, nearly half state when they're asked what's the most important issue for them, economy, education, employment are by far the most important issues. As you'd expect with people over the age of 40, the most predominant issue is that of health, poverty and welfare. But when you ask people what is the most important thing for them, the, the, the share of the population who state the constitutional issue is very low. So this is what we mean by the next generation of the peace process. If we're going to build an issue-based society and a policy-based society, then we should have a politics that reflects the needs of the people who live in that society. And the needs of this society are education, jobs, employment, health, poverty, and welfare. Thank you, Catherine. One of the other things we've heard is that Brexit has had this major effect upon a desire for Irish unification. There are other, there are other uh, surveys and polls that are taking place, but here we have some that are conducted by the university. And you can see very clearly that the significant majority of people still wish to remain within the United Kingdom. Around one in five Catholics wish to remain in the United Kingdom. So, so Brexit's had two effects. It has increased in more recent surveys, the share for those who wish for unification, but it's also increased the share of Protestants who wish to remain in the UK. So what, what, what this evidence would tell us is that Northern Ireland is going to be around for a while. It's not denying that there may, may not be changes or a decline in the economy would not change that. But we have to be honest here and we have to be reflective. The majority of people presently wish to remain in the UK. And that has to be something that is reflected in our politics. It doesn't mean you don't work for United Ireland. It doesn't mean you don't campaign for United Ireland. But it also is important that an international audience knows that there is still a significant share who wish to remain within the UK. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Also, what's happened in our society has been a shift in recent years in politics. So the top line in this graph is the Ulster Unionist Party, and the Democratic Unionists, those wishing to remain in the UK. And you can see that their electoral fortunes have declined since 2001. But Sinn Féin and the SDLP have also had a significant decline or a decline in their electoral fort fortunes in elections in Northern Ireland. The Alliance Party, which in 2001 was getting 3% of the vote, is now setting close to 20% of the vote. And this is also reflected in our surveys in that increasingly, especially amongst young people, they don't choose the title or the label, sorry, of nationalist and unionist. They choose something which is free-flowing. They choose a non-identity. And, and this is reflective of the changes in our society. If you reform a society, if you take away violence, people mix, people congregate, people work together. Our last survey showed a really big growth in people in mixed religion relationship. So, so there's something more sophisticated that's happening in our society. And, and one of those things is a shift away from traditional politics towards other political ideas and notions, etc. And then for the next slide, Catherine, please. So what we argue for, and you'd be glad to know this is my final slide, is the concept of interdependence. What we want to do is to get beyond the binary. We want to get beyond that the solution is simply a border pole of the status quo. We want to have facts. We want to have a third option. We want to have a middle way. We, we articulate the whole process of understanding lives and how they are lived on the island of Ireland. And we call for interdependence, that we build relationships, we extend the Good Friday Agreement. We know more about each other. We learn about each other. We drive the economy in the island of Ireland, all of which is for that middle way. We get beyond the binary, we get into the business of the next generation of the peace process. People's lives are increasingly intercommunity. People's lives are increasingly dependent. So let us drive that and give that the significance that it deserves. Good Friday Agreement, the protocol, the shared island unit for the from the Taoiseach's office, all of those are ways to build and sustain interdependence and for us to get beyond the wearied and bogged down way of conjecture and sectarian head counting. We're asking for the spirit of parity of state with mutual respect to become something which is much more significant than it has been to present. The protocol enhances all island relationships. I'm from a pro-union community. I support that. I want all island connections. I want those things to be opportunities for cultural, political, and economic engagement. I want to, to, the border to be invisible. I want this society to be something that is very different to what it has been. And finally, in promoting greater North-South cooperation and with Northern Ireland within the Customs Code and the Customs Territory, we actually have an opportunity here to build a new economy, a new society, and 
in the 100th year of the two states, build a whole series of ways in which we interact with each other in ways that are positive, mutual, and for the coexistence of all of the people who live in this island. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, for that. Our next speaker is Alison Grundle. Alison is a former special advisor in the Northern Ireland Assembly Ministry of Justice. She comes from a corporate background working with multinational companies. She's also contributed in a number of initiatives with Liverpool University's Institute of Irish Studies. In particular, she's contributed research on the initial Brexit report that was entitled A Contagion of Uncertainty. I turn it over to you, Alison. Thank you, Patrick, and um, welcome everyone. Um, I have the unenviable task of sort of explaining the protocol to you today, but um, you know, where Pete has, has taken us to is, is an explanation of the st peace and stability that we had in Northern Ireland before Brexit. And I think it's fair to say that um, during the whole Brexit campaign, there was um, no um, real consideration given to the consequences for Northern Ireland. Uh, may I have the next slide, please, Catherine? So don't want to give you a history lesson here, but by way of a little context, basically the UK has long had a troubled relationship with Europe uh, from the very point at which we joined um, the EU in, in what was the European community in 1973, right up until the referendum in 2016. Every major political party within the United Kingdom has had its Brexit, uh, has had its EU detractors, but none more so than, than the Conservative Party. And by 2015, David Cameron, who was then the Prime Minister, was entering an election with his back to the wall on the need to make a promise on an in-out referendum if he won. He did win, and um, the path for the referendum was then set. We had the election, the referendum in 2016, which voted narrowly to leave, and there followed a, basically a turbulent um, five years um, in, in British politics that saw David Cameron and Theresa May both lose um, their positions as Prime Minister, right up until we had Boris Johnson um, in December 2019, and he finally negotiated a withdrawal agreement with the EU that I think it's fair to say was much harsher than most people had actually expected, and it included the protocol on Northern Ireland. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So if we look at the problem the protocol was created to solve, basically, when the UK left the EU, it meant leaving the single market. So what we had was all the countries who made up the European Union operated free trade within the confines of the European Union. When the EU, when, sorry, when the UK voted to leave, that created a difficulty in the sense that we needed to basically cre create a frontier between what was EU territory and what was not. And the only place, the only place that there was a, that there was a land border between the EU and the UK was on the island of Ireland. However, almost immediately following the referendum result, a clamour started around peace and stability on the island, uh, which led both Theresa May and subsequently Boris Johnson to agree that there would be no hard border on the island of Ireland. Uh, at that point, they also agreed um, to retain the common travel area, which is significant. Um, whenever the UK left the EU, all travel between Europe and um, the United Kingdom stopped in relation to people being able to live and work freely in any of the countries. However, that was retained for Ireland uh, and the UK, basically because it, it predates the EU and goes right back to um, 1922 and the creation of the two states on the island of Ireland. So basically, without a hard border on the island of Ireland, where was the frontier going to be placed? And that was the uh, solution that, that needed to be found. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. So what we have here is a map, which I hope shows very clearly how stark this problem is. The uh, area in blue is the United Kingdom territory and the area in white is the rest of Ireland, which of course is the EU. And you can then see that on this tiny island, we have EU and UK territory coexisting. The land border had been ruled out and therefore the only other option was realistically to create what the protocol now decrees, 
which is a sea border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. What this means in practice is that any goods that come from Great Britain to Northern Ireland are effectively treated as if they could enter into the, the European Union single market and therefore they require customs declarations, masses of paperwork and actual physical checks and in the case of um, um, food meat based products, um, actual uh, veterinarian checks. So it's a substantial imposition on trade between two parts of the same jurisdiction and this has become hugely problematic um, in, in both in the way that it has been um, implemented and in the larger problems that it has now led to uh, because it has moved from being a situation whereby it was, it was a trade issue into one that has now played out along the established lines of identity division in this island. Uh, next slide please Catherine. So if we look at the challenges that the protocol has brought us, we can easily um, split them in, into two very distinct areas. One we'll describe as, as practical and the other we will describe as symbolic. Now, it's very important to remember that the predominant trading agreement, uh, sorry, the predominant trading relationship exists east-west. It is between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, i.e. the territory that is the, the, United, Ki the United Kingdom. Um, many, many more times um, trade happens in, uh, from, from, from Great Britain to, uh, to Northern Ireland than happens um, in the rest of the island. And, and therefore, any trade, internal trade barriers were always going to be problematic. One of the largest, I think, early problems that, that um, was, was created by the protocol was the way in which it was implemented. Following, and then the run up, to the um, UK finally leaving, um, there was a transition period uh, and then a withdrawal period, during which time negotiations were supposed to put um, in place the, 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 the route by which seamless and, and simplified um, um, protocol uh, could, could come into force. What happened in practice was that all of the available time was taken up in negotiating the withdrawal agreement and the protocol so that there was literally no time left for any preparation to be made. In some cases, um, there were processes that were being um, issued 12 hours before they actually came into force. And on New Year's Day um, 2021, when the protocol came into effect, it's fair to say there, there, there was a fair degree of um, chaos. This could have been avoided if the UK government had agreed to extend or had asked the EU if they could extend the transition period. But the leaving of the EU on the date that Boris Johnson had declared 31st of December was fixed in stone politically within Britain and the consequences for trade with uh, in, into Northern Ireland was largely overlooked or ignored depending on your point of view and therefore uh, there was a, a degree of, of chaos that uh, came thereafter. Now, in some areas, it was just too important um, to, to um, um, not have um, a, a, an extended period. So we introduced what were called grace periods, whereby some of the most impactful changes have been delayed. And I guess a key one uh, would be around the issue of medicines coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Uh, and we've actually had quite a lot of tension around when those grace periods are going to run out. Um, some of them were initially for three months. The United Kingdom then, in a period of very bad relationship with the EU, decided unilaterally to extend those grace periods without further consultation with the EU. But where we are this week, and we literally are week by week, day by day on this developing relationship. But I think as of this morning, when I when I last um, caught up with it, um, the EU and, and the UK has asked the EU if it has its permission to extend the grace periods uh, to try and mitigate some of the most serious issues around the um, um, supply lines for things like medicines. So we've had a very difficult um, relationship with um, between the EU and the UK, which has caused problems, practical problems for Northern Ireland. I think one of the things that Pete alluded to um, is that it's important to realise that Brexit is not an event 
in terms of the Northern Ireland peace process, and we shouldn't view it as such. It's actually a process, and and it's going to be around for a long time. And uh, you know, as the e e UK moves further away from EU standards and rules and starts to introduce its own, this is going to cause problems for Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland effectively operates as if it were a member of the EU for goods traveling into the, um, the rest of Ireland and out to the EU, but it is also within the UK Customs Code. So every change that happens within the UK is going to have a knock-on effect for Northern Ireland that is then going to have to be renegotiated. However, if the relationships between Britain and uh, the EU can remain cordial, then we think that those things can settle down and be resolved. Symbolic changes, on the other hand, cause us a slightly more uh, problematic situation. So. Democratic Unionist Party, Northern Ireland's largest political uh, unionist party, had um, supported the uh, government all the way through on Brexit. And when the protocol was um, uh, agreed, they felt very bruised. Um, they had been loyal supporters of Brexit. They believed that the UK would leave the EU as one single jurisdiction. And instead, they believe they ended up with a border down the Irish Sea. And this has now fueled the opposition and protests that both Patrick and um, Pete referred to. There's a feeling within some sections of unionism that the protocol's concession to nationalism, that where uh, a customs border between the two separate jurisdictions on the island of Ireland, Ireland was not acceptable, a sea border within the same jurisdiction in the UK became acceptable, and that has, has caused problems. Uh, furthermore, uh, with the trade barriers now that exist between Britain and Northern Ireland, the supply lines have naturally pivoted towards increasing trade on the island, and that has led people to feel that there's an economic integration that's happening, which will be a, a, a forerunner of United Ireland. Um, but in terms of the peace process itself, leaving the EU does not have a direct effect on it. It doesn't threaten the uh, Good Friday Agreement in any way. However, what it has brought is what Pete referred to the, the calls for a border poll and the future constitutional position. And um, it, one of the things that I just want to make, actually make a very quick point on this and I'll wrap up because I'm realizing I'm over time. It is seldom recognised that the UK actually moved to allay some of the fears that, that were raised, um, but particularly within nationalism around um, equality and interaction points north-south on the island. And, and the, the UK has actually introduced special legislation to protect both of those issues and to protect the, pro the peace process. But um, one of the things that we do need to, re to, to really reiterate is that we are two small islands who are entwined in each other's economies and each other's peoples. Separation is not an option for us. The peace process has endured through a number of crises over 23 years. We have dealt with bigger issues than this. We are not going back to war. And once we get through this stage of the process, we believe that there are huge economic opportunities for the whole island of Ireland brought about by the um, protocol. And we also believe that the United States has a really important role to make that happen. I will now hand back to Patrick and Michael will pick up on where we think these opportunities are. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alison. Um, our next speaker is Michael Darcy. Michael is Senior Research Associate at the Center for Cross-Border Studies. He has extensive experience in economic and regulatory reform at regional, all-island, EU, and international levels. He's also an experienced interlocutor, mentor, and lecturer. And last year, co-authored with Pete Sherlow, uh, the Institute of Irish, uh, the Irish Studies at Liverpool's landmark report on Ireland Northern, on the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, entitled The Contagion of Uncertainty, the same one that Alison also contributed to through her research. Michael. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'd like to, you've noticed a certain theme of positivity running through this, so I'm going to add substantially to it, but I hope on the basis of plausible optimism. So I've been involved in promoting economic uh, cooperation and interaction between North and South since the early 1990s, since before the Good Friday Agreement and in the uh, aftermath of the ceasefires. And I can say that throughout that period, it is always about what Peter referred to, the issues of employment, education, and the economy. And that is absolutely the key issue for us right now. So I'd like to address that in terms of the next generation, the Good Friday Agreement, and the opportunities that it provides to sustain prosperity and embed peace. Following Brexit, there is definitely a new and very different relationship that we have to contend with, and we have to actually deal with. 
And that for me is captured best in the first paragraph of strand two of the Good Friday Agreement, which refers to the totality of relationships, which now incorporates, as Alison said, relationships within Northern Ireland, between Northern Ireland and the Republic, this island and GB, this island and the rest of the EU, which is very much in its perspective I'm coming from, and the context of this conversation, relationships between this island and the United States. So within that, I think there's a pathway to progress in the terminology used. They it talks about consultation, cooperation, and action within the island of Ireland. And the key word here, I think, is action. I think it's important to remember that this agreement reached in the multi-party negotiations, and that's this is an early first edition, and that was the original title before it was good called the Good Friday Agreement, is very important that we progress on the basis of multi-party to negotiations and agreement. Within that, and in the context of the island and all that con connectivity, I believe there are multiple uh, economic and business opportunities that can drive this progress. Starting with COVID recovery, as we speak, staycations this year means staying on the island of Ireland. People from north are going to holiday in the south, south holiday in the north, bringing money, jobs right across the island. That's possible consequent on the CTA and the protocol climate change or more particularly climate action. There are many climate actions that won't be optimum unless they're coherent and coordinated on the island because it is an island. And also going to mention global tax and the evolution of global tax law, which I'll come back to later, which I think is an important challenge and indeed opportunity for the island. But underpinning all this essentially is the Good Friday Agreement protected by the protocol because it provides political, social and regulatory stability for business and business needs that to operate, to develop, and most especially to invest. Thanks, Catherine. Next slide, please. So some positive economic indicators. I'll start with demographics and population. The island is now has a population of almost 7 million and will exceed 8 million soon, possibly within the next couple of decades. And of course, for Irish America especially, that 8 million is a very symbolic figure because that is the pre-famine population of the island after which many people left. And consequently, we have so many people in the United States with an Irish American heritage. However, I also note that 8 million will put us, there will be 38 states in the United States with a population less than 8 million. So I think that's a reasonable uh, market uh, capacity. In terms of why people are staying, well, there's an indicator. The Ireland's GDP in 2020 was $340 billion, a pretty impressive sum meaning a developed, modern, global player, economically successful. And a lot of that growth has occurred since the ceasefire, since the Good Friday Agreement. And I particularly use that figure despite the controversy over it relating to foreign direct investment because US corporations do make a significant contribution to it in both jurisdictions. And in terms of the potential, again, to underline the point, the protocol is unique because it is all island. It combines the possibility to do business with the UK and the EU. It does that to address the unique problems of the island, as indicated by Peter, in terms of how a post-conflict society, and it's underpinned by the Good Friday Agreement with its unique three-strand approach, north-south, within the Northern Ireland, sorry, north-south and then east-west. And most of all, that creates a unique business proposition. Uh, Kat, Kat, thank you, Catherine. At the heart of that proposition, going to education for a moment, there is a fact, and this is a table put together by IBEC, Ireland's largest business uh, organization with their Northern Ireland and UK colleagues, CBI, for their joint business council on the percentage of 30 to 35 year olds educated at the third level. You see currently the island is only bettered by Luxembourg and Sweden, but within that you can see Northern Ireland is between 30 and 40%, whereas Ireland is over 50%. The whole of the island achieved the high level, possibly the island would actually have the highest percentage of 30 to, five, 30 to 35 year olds educated at the third level. And that's a tremendous resource for business to work for. It means it's, it's an absolutely true claim that the island has potentially the most educated workforce in Europe. Next slide, please, Captain. So what are the business opportunities? Well, first of all, renew and reset strategies and plans. Any plans to date have been based on the previous scenario, pre-Brexit. Now there's a new scenario underpinned by the protocol and going forward here, because many of my thoughts are placed in a 5, 10, 15, even 20 year scenario, which is what business looks to to get investment returns. So 
that will be taking this business development will be taking place not just with the protocol but also in a us uk trade arrangement in a us eu trade agreement a sort of a triangularity within which will sit the island of ireland uniquely in the middle of that new relationship across the atlantic and that's a really important point to keep in mind that's why I also present the possibility that the all island investment opportunities occur on an island basis, such as in energy, where there's already a single electricity market, pharmaceuticals, where there's a joined up production and manufacturing process that highly advanced. In fact, after Belgium, Ireland will be the next country to produce COVID vaccination uh, support. Agri-food, where in fact the dairy business is as there's as much milk produced in the island of Ireland, would you believe, as on GB, and we all know about digital service and the Googles, and Microsoft, et cetera, this world face that are in Ireland and transport. And build back better together. I'm very aware that the term build back better has been used by the president in terms of his policies. And I'm very aware of adding together to that. I'm talking about North and South within Northern Ireland, within the island of Ireland and GB, and the island of Ireland and potentially with the United States to leverage the protocol and the global tax changes in order to protect and retain US global business productive base here on the island. And I know that this debate is a lot of negativity in it, but there is one strand of positivity, and that is the fact that the investment by US corporates on the island of Ireland is underpinning peace and prosperity. And my last slide, what can US political class do to support this? First, foremost, and urgently, President Biden can appoint a special envoy to the island. And I mean to the island, the context of the island and of the agreement, the Good Friday Agreement with its three strands, Northern Ireland, North, South, East, West, to develop the, and to discuss with all the political parties, civic societies, et cetera, the benefits and purpose and opportunities of its new challenge in the context of the post-Brexit scenario. Following from that, the USTR could pursue the offer, the very generous offer, in my view, that has got insufficient attention by President Biden before the G7 summit, that arrangements in any US-UK FTA for agri-food could be consistent with those in the protocol. This is an absolute sticking point currently within the UK GB, UK EU scenario and negotiations. And I think it's a very generous offer for the president. The USTR should pursue that because it's been lost in all the politics recently. Thirdly, the US Senate, a very interesting res motion, uh, Senate Resolution 117, talks about, a, at least in my view, provides a basis for protecting, for a further conversation on protecting the agreement. And they should now move on to uh, how to consider the question, how could the US re-energize North-South cooperation to support peace on the island? And finally, but certainly not least, US-Ireland programs and initiatives could reset, re-energize and renew. This is a unique moment. It would not be a commentary on the work done to date. It would actually be an opportunity to build back better into the new scenario and the new totality of relationships that exists as a consequence of the opportunities now presented to us. And perhaps the first steps to do that could be in the context of participating in our transatlantic conversations. Thank you, Michael. And our last panelist is Barbara Stevenson. Barbara is Vice Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officer at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a former US ambassador and, is, and a distinguished career diplomat whose service included acting ambassador at the US Embassy in London, as well as the US Consul General in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Welcome, Barbara. You're on mute, Barbara. That's classic. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I wanted to structure my remarks by giving um, a few highlights from the other speakers, both to, to fulfill our role of setting the scene for the series and also just to highlight some of the successes of the peace process that I think we all need to remember. Then I'm going to move into some specific thoughts on the U.S. role in supporting continued progress here. So on some of those highlights, a big thank you to Alison Grundle for explaining to all of us what happened with Brexit and the border. It is a daunting topic, and I was part of a number of panels in the last year or so where we who care about peace in our, on the island of Ireland and Northern Ireland 
were concerned that Brexit would cause a reinstatement of that hard land border between Northern Ireland and the Republic and possibly spark violence. And there were vivid memories that were recalled in some of those discussions of Sinn Féin and the IRA, Republican forces clashing with uniformed forces at the border that were regarded as, and indeed often were, British. So it was kind of the imposition of crown justice would, would come back in and we'd have this return to the bad old days of the troubles. And that analysis always seemed to me to, to downplay a bit one of what uh, one of the biggest successes of the peace process. And that is the transformation of the police, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, a paramilitary force that really excelled at uh, keeping IRA violence in check transformed itself into the police service of Northern Ireland, an institute, as Pete showed us, that today earns more than 70% confidence ratings, not only from Protestants, but also from Catholics. That, folks, is a sea change, and it is one of the huge, huge uh, successes of the Northern Ireland peace process. So I urge anyone who is, you know, studies the Northern Ireland peace process for lessons learned to give proper weight to the transformation of policing. Catholics just no longer see the police as imposing crown justice. They are much more likely to say the police service of Northern Ireland protects me and my community. And that is a very big success. As Allison explained though, Brexit meant there had to be a border. There's just no way around that. You can't have the UK leave the EU and not have a border. So rather than cutting across the island of Ireland, that border ended up in the Irish Sea, as she explained so well, between England and Northern Ireland. So we Americans were all expecting to see clashes in Ireland after Brexit, but we were expecting to see clashes between Catholic slash nationalist slash Republican forces against a kind of a British police force. That is not what we're seeing. What we're seeing instead, what we saw in April was unionists, Protestants who were on the streets in those clashes with the police. And so this is not just a return to the troubles. And I really want to kind of make that point that, that we're not just going back to war. And I'm so grateful to, to Peter Sherlow for all that clearly presented data that we're not seeing a, a return to the old narrative or anything like a widespread return to violence in Northern Ireland. So if you get a chance to visit or invest, go, it, you'll be happy you did. The other thing that I really want to highlight as a major success of the peace process is Peter's slide about the, the next generation in Northern Ireland are 15 times more interested in the economy, education, and employment than they are in constitutional issues, like the details of whether Northern Ireland fits more into the UK than into the Republic of, of Ireland. This to me is another landmark success of the Northern Ireland peace process, more than 20 years with of a gener giving a generation a chance to grow up not knowing violence and able to imagine a different future. And one that I'd like to add might involve marrying having children and having those children know their grandparents right there in Northern Ireland, which was always something people longed for when I was Consul General there. I really welcome um, Pete's thinking on interdependence as a way to keep making progress as the troubles slide into the rearview mirror. That said though, there's nothing inevitable about continued progress. And the tensions that we're seeing now they're political and they're identity based and those overlap. Those are real, they're deeply felt and you have to pay attention to them. As Allison's made clear, unionists really feel, um, they don't feel good about what's happened. They see an, um, a bad deal made, an erosion of British sovereignty and a weakening of British identity and a fear that this greater North-South cooperation may just be paving the way for Northern Ireland to become part of the Republic of Ireland. So we can't just turn our backs on it and wish it away. It's real. And I 
agree with the speakers who highlight the opportunities to sustain prosperity and embeds peace over the long run. But I also acknowledge the need to navigate the current tensions and this bumpy patch we're in with great care so that we can reach those opportunities. And finally, you can't get to prosperity uh, when you've got a lot of uncertainty and um, tension. We know that in general, business prefers stability and certainty. So I'm gonna to turn now to what can my country do? What is the role of the US ensuring in ensuring that, that progress continues and that there isn't backsliding and that a return to the bad old days of the troubles is just completely out of the question. So that's been, um, that was, that's my topic today. And it was my job for so many years First as like UK desk officer in the early nineties when the peace talk started. And then as consul general in Belfast, 2001 to four. And then again, when I was the senior um, American diplomat in the US embassy in London, and I had the unforgettable honor of scripting and organizing President Obama's visit in 2013. And he gave the talk in the waterfront hall about shared future. What should we do, the US? We need to continue championing peace in Northern Ireland and continue supporting the Good Friday and Belfast Agreement. And I really want to highlight how striking and remarkable it is that so many key positions in the US government are now held by such clear and outspoken champions for peace in Northern Ireland. Speaker, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Richie Neal. President Biden, President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan. This, there was nothing foreordained about this. And frankly, American demographics might suggest that this support from people who have identifies Irish American would have waned. I mean, think about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez replacing Joe Crowley. So the, the face of America is changing, but we have at this moment, an array of champions in place and seeing peace and prosperity in Ireland and seeing the Good Friday Agreement succeed is not, you know, 22 on a list of priorities. It's up there. Let's not take it for granted, but let's not assume that it will last forever. It comes at a crucial moment. There may be a free trade agreement between the US and the UK. I'm not sure it's a really uphill climb on that, but it is an important moment to have those champions in place who will play, make peace a priority. Pete called for interdependence, increasing inner community connection across the island of Ireland. And Michael urged all island investment opportunities. I wanna say that when I was Consul General back in 2001 to four, the idea of enhanced North-South cooperation was uncontroversial. Um, the U.S. just recognized that a number of issues, things like solid waste management and the electricity grid, they were inherently an all-island concern. And we gave no thought whatsoever to sponsoring study trips like the International Visitor Leader Program that included experts from Northern Ireland and the Republic to go together to the U.S. to look at how to solve the problem. Um, I did sense when I returned as the senior career diplomat um, at the US Embassy in London that the support for North South cooperation that had once been equally remarkable among the British officials that I worked with had shifted, and that the conservative government, because I had worked with Labour before, um, seemed more skeptical and a little less opening, open to a possible blurring of sovereignty. So all of those that are going to participate all the way through the three parts of the series, bear in mind that you will get a chance to hear in the third event in this series directly from the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And I hope you'll all listen carefully to how he treats this subject, because I think that's going to give us some important insight into how well received Michael's idea will be. His idea that the U.S. should appoint a special envoy to the island of Ireland. Now, let me be clear, U.S. Special Envoys have been part of the peace process for many years, spanning at least a few decades. So the idea of appointing a U.S. Special Envoy should not in itself be controversial. The question will be about the mandate. So as American Consul General in Belfast, I had two Special Envoys during my time, Mitchell Reese, uh, first uh, Richard Haas, then Mitchell Reese. And their mandate was special envoy for the Northern Ireland peace process. And they visited me about every six weeks and they 
pushed for progress on the peace agreement. And crucially, those envoys visited London, Dublin, they took the train north and met with all the parties here. So there was always an all island component to this. So appointing a new envoy with a similar mandate to what we've always done may not spark as much opposition as an envoy with an explicit all Ireland, all Ireland mandate. So I'd keep a close eye out for don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, just go for get an envoy in there. Finally, some other ways that the US can support. We have a, it's a remarkable thing to be the American Consul General and get to program the St. Patrick's Day events at the White House. I mean, it is the envy of diplomats, American diplomats around the world to have a showcase like that. It's still there. You can, you know, mix up the formula and decide what to champion. I did um, community-based uh, peace building. That's what I highlighted when I was um, Consul General. There's certainly an opportunity to highlight enhanced North-South ties. Um, I hope you'll encourage higher education ties. I'm now Vice Provost for Global Affairs at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. One of our most successful courses last year was a drama course tossed jointly online, collaborative online international learning with a university in Galway and a university in Northern Ireland and, and here. So that kind of collaboration is inexpensive and we can make that grow hundredfold and create the ties um, going forward. If anybody wants to talk to you about it, give me a call, send me an email. And finally, that network of private Irish American support. Um, the, uh, there's the, you know, the Washington Ireland program, there's the Ireland funds. Those can support progress on this as well. And I, I do recall that the last time we were able to gather for the Ireland fund dinner in March of 2019, it was House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who gave the keynote. So my last comment, the US has US support for the Northern Ireland peace process and for an Ireland that's prosperous and at peace all the way through has always been rich and multifaceted and really heartfelt. It's always been about more than no more bombs on the mainland. We've already talked about how many people in this country identify as Irish American, but loads of people like me I've just been adopted into the family and it's a deep, deep caring that we've got. And we won't be satisfied until the Good Friday Agreement yields the full fruit of a peaceful, prosperous place where the next generation is eager to build a shared future. So count on us to still be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, thanks to all our panelists for offering some clarity on these many tangled issues. Uh, Barbara used the term a crucial moment, and I have to say a number of you came back to that ideal a couple of times. We could call it a tipping point, but maybe better, it's sort of a turning point, because what I see our panelists uh, encouraging us to think about it is this is kind of not only a moment of peril, you know, and Allison reminded us of some of those specific perils having to do with the protocol and what Brexit means for it. But as Pete was trying to suggest, this is potentially also a moment of hope. So he's asking us, as he put it, to look beyond the binary and realizing how successful the peace process has been and to double down on that peace process. Michael also encouraged, he really gave us a call to action. He saw this as a moment for economic and business opportunities. Uh, and he said that Ireland is particularly peculiarly situated now for what he calls triangularity because of its relationship between the United States to the United States and also the UK and now the EU. He sees Ireland is somehow poised. Um, but Barbara then brings us back once again to the tipping point. She, of course, told us about the progress. And she said, now we're at again this crucial moment where it's going to be very, very important for people not to look back, as she put it, into the rearview mirror. But we have to look ahead by again doubling down on peace and on the Good Friday Agreement. And she believes now the United States has a particularly important role to play in kind of, if you will, championing that vision. So I thank you all for, for all of that, as I say, helping us kind of manage these thickets. Um, you'll see again the Q&A function. We'll try to get to some of your questions right now. We have them flowing in, so that's encouraging. Let me ask a question first to Pete and to Allison. And it was the first question that came in just as you were talking, actually, Pete. And it gets to Allison's point about the practical versus the symbolic. The symbolic, it seems, always features in Northern Ireland or is featured in Northern Ireland up to this point. What makes you think that evidence-based work and a focus on the practical can maybe move us beyond the binaries? I'd like to hear the basis for the hope that you both expressed early on. 
Well, I think, I think the whole idea of an evidence-based approach is uh, it's sort of within that phrase itself. And, and I think we have to look at these identity shifts that are taking place in society. Clearly, uh, the only way to advance a society which has fragmented identities is law. And, and, and I think what, what, what we've seen, as I mentioned, the housing executive policing reform and the issues around fair employment, which led to the removal of uh, discrimination in work, that that, that that architecture of the Good Friday Agreement is critical. And, and what is critical is when you make change won't happen without legal, uh, without law being established. And I think that's an unfortunate thing that, that we can't come to agreements through conversation. But but all of these issues, like the cultural package, you know, we, we take the issue of the Irish language, which is contentious. Uh, but the, the Irish Language Act is represented in the media as to do with the, the, the Irish Language Act. Irish language, sorry, it's actually a cultural package for all communities. So, so, so that has a potential when settled to, of course, take us beyond these, these cultural wars, etc. But the thing is, the peace process doesn't develop in jumps. It doesn't develop in leaps. It develops incrementally. So, so if you take that 1998 high identity politics, 20 years later, significant shares of people are saying, I'm not unionist or nationalist, I'm something else. So, so the thing to understand in all of these processes, Patrick, is that it's chipping away, it's changing that dynamic. When, when you have people working together, people being educated together, when you have people socializing together, I don't mean this in a very full way, but that does have potential changes. The biggest threat to the peace process is not recognizing those changes. That's what the fundamental problem is, not recognizing how this society, and how the South also has changed. With it. it got the economic dividend, which is critically important as well. So it's a mixture of law, but also stepping back and going, there are significant changes here that took place, and not recognise them actually impedes progress. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Alison? Yeah, um, I just want to say that I think it's absolutely vitally important that we do take an evidence-based approach, and we live in a society where myth is very powerful, and we need to start to break that down. Um, the example of Brexit is hugely pertinent to this. You know, we had slogans on the side of a bus saying that spend the 350 million a week we send to the EU on the NHS could never have been realized. And, and, and to work in fact and evidence is, is vitally important. In Northern Ireland today, we have a scenario whereby there are certain sections um, within the unionist community who believe that the Northern Ireland peace process has delivered for nationalists, but not for them. And if you go and look at the actual facts um, around the multiple deprivation index, you will see that 70%, over 70% of the most deprived areas in Northern Ireland are actually within nationalist areas, not unionist areas. And we have got to always put forward the evidence and hopefully you know it will resonate thank you allison the next question has to do it's really kind of a, a a recent history question and i turn this over to michael and then to barbara i'd like to know uh, one of our, our our questioners wants to know about the impact of the good friday agreement and the republic's recent or semi-recent economic boom on relations between the north and between the republic and also relations between Ireland and the United States. Has the relationships between these fundamental uh, parts of this kind of transatlantic conversation changed over the past, say, couple decades, and how so? Very interesting question. Um, how clearly it has changed. I mean, everyone is aware of the Celtic Tiger, the period of productive growth, exceptional productive growth that Ireland experienced between in the 1990s and the wake of the ceasefires. And this was the Republic of Ireland at that stage. And it really was a very dynamic period in the history of this state because it put it really catapulted it into the 21st century. It turned the island into a center of a global, you know, pushed us into the midst of the global economy. There was a recession hit us very hard but in fact we recovered very quickly and Ireland has consistently for the last decade been the only EU country to register growth. Now there has been spillover into Northern Ireland as a consequence of that the stability has been good for Northern Ireland it is anyone in Northern Ireland can see the improvement the investment 
around them, the physical infrastructure of Belfast, Derry, other cities, etc. One of the most successful uh, sectors in Belfast has been the tourism sector. A lot of that has been delivered. 64% of visitors to Northern Ireland come through Dublin Airport, for example, and travel north every year, at least pre-COVID. It's also important to understand that uh, there's a lot more of what I would call an all-island all labour market. You have a company like Allstate, Northern Ireland's largest US and FDI investor. It draws a proportion of its workforce from the Republic, particularly its location near Derry in the west of the province. So there's a whole joining up of business activity on the island that has occurred. How has that changed the relationship? I think hugely. I remember in the early 90s, post the troubles, there was a huge level of distrust in between uh, people and between businesses, there was a huge level of fear to do business. Ireland had the lowest level of economic activity. The border in Ireland had the, was the least cross border for economic purposes in the EEC back in 1992, even though it was an island. That is transformed now. We're still not the most active in cross border, but we're definitely in the median. So that has been transformed in terms of the relationship between Ireland and the United States, again, a huge proportion, but not all of this foreign direct investment has come from the United States, both in a manufacturing context, the pharmaceutical, medical devices, also in digital services, etc. That's pushed us to the forefront of the whole global tax debate, quite extraordinary, really, that we're in that position. So I think that therefore, these are new factors and new drivers. But I mean, to me, it's about retention now. Can we retain these businesses as the global taxation environment settles into a new paradigm? where it's not about competition, but it's developing what is and what countries have already got. And I think Ireland starts with a very strong position. I think Northern Ireland's position to take advantage of that. And on the ground, what businesses tell me is that investors are already looking at that. There's already conversations going on. And finally, one of the biggest challenges, funny enough, I'll make a prediction here, might be for Northern Ireland to deal with the issue of success. What happens if Northern Ireland has a very dramatic Celtic Tiger period and comes under the stresses and strains that we have in the 1990s? could be really transformational. And that's where I think, again, joining up the capacities in both jurisdictions will be big help in that regard. Well, we'll file that one under the hopeful <laughs> you know, in our kind of dipping point here. Barbara, well, you had mentioned, and so if I can just ask you to address that as well, but particularly from the American angle, because you had mentioned, interestingly, that in some ways, fundamentally, the relationship between Ireland and between the United States has changed, largely because of the fact that the Irish aren't kind of streaming over in the numbers that they had, and maybe Joe Biden may be ironically the last Irish president. But have you seen changes to the relationship between Ireland and America over these past decades? C certainly. I mean, I think if we actually had somebody who had those um, migration figures at their fingertips, we'd see that there have been more uh, folks moving to Ireland than from Ireland to America over the last decade. Um, and I think I agree with Michael. I think the boom in the Republic, which is just a remarkable uh, economic transformation, it's a force in its own right. And it was it started before really the Good Friday Agreement took hold. But I don't think you can see some of the big gains in, in Northern Ireland without the Good Friday Agreement. Um, when I was there, tourism was non-existent, you know. Um, it just, it, people were still had this image of Northern Ireland as a place where there was rioting in the streets and there were armed cops. And so I remember cruise ships started to call and they would just put Belfast on there and they would then do surveys. And the surveys would say, you know, of all the ports of call that I picked my cruise for, Belfast was last because it was no, it was not some place I was going to visit. And now that I spent a day there, I'm definitely coming back with the family. So once people saw it, they loved it, but they had to get over the the impression of it. And I think about um, Allstate and and Seagate and doing the big investment conference when I was consul general and the executives that brought that huge business, that investment into Northern Ireland from the United States described kind of uniformly that they had to sell this to a skeptical board. It was like, oh my God, the government has fallen, Stormont has collapsed. You know, what do you mean bringing these things in? And that always a few years later, they looked like geniuses, you know, in their company because 
it's a great workforce. It's that education that we, we talked about. I mean, education is really, it's not just a lot of people get educated in Ireland. It's a great education. My, my, my daughter was a beneficiary of it, I have to say, and it stood her in good stead all along. And it isn't that it's low wage employment, because it's not, but it's um, smart employees who are loyal and will stay with an employer. So that churn that the companies face in the US, they didn't face. And I know Seagate walked me through um, incremental innovation step by step to make the kind of computer chips the piece that you need. It has to be 100% reliable what they make. And their workforce up in the North Coast near Colerain was just uh, exactly who you entrusted this to. So I think that getting over the skepticism that Northern Ireland was a sketchy place, you needed the Good Friday Agreement. The boom in the Republic, I mean, it's been a force in its own right, and a 13% corporate tax rate is, is, is part of it, um, and it, it allowed people to, um, you know, move a lot of backroom operations to the Republic of Ireland and then, claim, you know, account for profits there. So um, it took off, and it, and it, it has... Um, it had a force of its own and it, I remember listening to the Chamber of Commerce from Dublin. I went to an event when I was Consul General and they really, Americans were confident in investing in Ireland, North and South, that they would not have their capital taken from them and that they were actually all but walking into their cousins and that they would, they would be treated fairly under the law. And I don't think you should ever, ever underestimate that for bringing American capital in. And you know what? I can't think of a single case when it wasn't honored. It's a big deal. Usually when you're the American Consul General, you start, you're, you're the American ambassador. You spend all this time with American companies who invested in the country that you're accredited to, and then their money got expropriated or ripped off or their contract disputes, and it, they're unfair and they're not getting a fair shake. It's a huge part of the work of an American diplomat. It is non-existent when you're doing it in Northern Ireland, and it's, I think it's non-existent in the Republic as well. That is a really important thing, and I hope it never goes away. Well, thank you, Barbara. The next two questions come from a few doubting Thomases when it comes to the optimistic take that you guys have on things. And so um, uh, I, let me pose these two. The first one I would like, if you could, Peter and Barbara, I'd love to hear your perspective on it, an insider and then so-called so like kind of uh, inside outsider on this. And it's just a simple question. Come on. Is the Northern Ireland Protocol sustainable at this point? Is Did Brexit present such challenges that really kind of make for uh, a, a situation that cannot fundamentally be fixed. So Pete, it's yours and then Barbara, after that, the next question, then I'll ask Michael and Allison. Well, f f first of all, I may say the, uh, the protocol has always led to invest Northern Ireland as our uh, body that drives the economy. And uh, 30 businesses have already been in touch, uh, wishing to invest in Northern Ireland because of its unique position in that it will trade. Uh, we're in the U EU customs code and also the UK Customs Territory. This is yet again the point we're making here about evidence. The headlines are filled with violence. A few thousand people, Republicans and loyalist kids rioting, a few hundred kids. There are thousands of kids who live in those areas who were not out rioting. And yet again, this is the whole way of concern about optics that we have. There's a major opportunity here to invest in this society. The protocol creates a new dynamic, which is a unique position. I'm sure business people in Britain would love to be able to trade directly into the EU without being fettered or, or, or less fettered. And I think that, that this is part of the problematic. The identity politics will disappear. And, and, and what will happen is uh, there will be some level of negotiation between the EU and UK, and there'll be some way in which these issues will be resolved. But yet again, negativity. What is the point of negativity in, in terms of what is a major economic opportunity? And, and, if you, and if you follow the problematic headlines and the stories and the narratives, yet again, you get this identity politics. I'm from a pro-union background. Allison's from a pro-union background. We support the, the, the protocol. We encourage the protocol. We know business people from pro-union backgrounds who support the protocol. So, so, so if you get caught up in this dynamic of a few thousand people out of a population of 1.8 million who are on the streets, and if you get caught up in that dynamic, you're completely undermining the reality that this is not a simple binary, Catholics support the protocol, Protestants oppose it, that is a nonsense, fiction. And, and therefore, when we get beyond fiction, then we have proper conversations, 
And whenever the protocol is enacted, then we get into the business of creating jobs, creating a peace dividend, extending the next generation of the peace process, and developing a society which will then, if Northern Ireland becomes a better society, will make constitutional change easier. And if Northern Ireland becomes a better society, why do we need constitutional change? So if you're asking the question, how do you get rid of identity politics? It is the building of a successful society in which those issues become less relevant. Thanks, Pete. Barbara, of course, you were in the business of squaring circles as a diplomat. I'd imagine you're probably doing even more so now as an associate provost. So what do you think? Is this protocol something sustainable? So one of the reasons I was so pleased about having a chance to be part of this panel was to get to hear from Peter and Allison and Michael about that. And what I hear, which is that this is not the biggest obstacle that we face, and that there are as many opportunities in there as there are downsides, all of that strikes me as right, and I'm counting on them about that. Where I guess I would have a slightly different take than Pete is um, I would never underestimate the risk that identity politics blurs the facts and, and, and that emotion and identity politics meeting up as they do in Northern Ireland under the Good Friday Agreement where we generally elect people on sectarian tickets and give ministries according to the DeHaunt process. I, I think that you can't count on that to get through that patch smoothly. And um, one of the ways that I saw identity become less relevant in Northern Ireland had to do with, it was the EU softened a lot of those questions. You know, if we were all EU, Irish and U, uh, English, it didn't make as many choices in there. Um, and it was fading. I completely agree. Identity politics was fading. I sat with a well-known DUP senior leader who showed me his Irish passport and said, eh, it's easier to travel on an Irish passport. So we were reaching that point. What I don't know is whether this rupture here is actually going to slow down the fading of identity politics. And that's a question that you need somebody like Pete or Allison that are on the ground to really say, but I worry about that. I worry that the the, the declining interest in this identity politics that we've been tracking as an optimistic sign, it may level off because that identity has been forced back into the forefront. That's my concern. Thank you, Barbara. So the next one, the one thing we, of course, haven't really mentioned much up to this point has been the United Kingdom and has been Boris Johnson. So that's one name we haven't mentioned. But now we have a question that I'd like to ask Allison to address first and then Michael afterward. The other critical question here is that to British to Britain's actions over the past five years inspire confidence that they will um, abide by the Good Friday Agreement or the Northern Ireland Protocol. Alison. Great question. Uh, as someone who doesn't share the politics of uh, Boris Johnson, um, I uh, have watched with dismay uh, his behavior uh, on, on uh, an, a number of occasions. But um, I think one thing that that really does give me confidence is what I see as a very evident change of approach within the Northern Ireland office. Um, Brandon Lewis, Northern Ireland Secretary, who's going to be speaking next week on this um, um, series of webinars, uh, is a much more hands-on um, Secretary of State than we've had in some time. And I don't think that's down to personality. I think it's down to strategy. Uh, I think on, under Theresa May, we had um, James Brokenshire and Karen Bradley, who were collectively known as the one, one thing that everyone in Northern Ireland agreed on, they were the worst secretaries of state we'd ever had. And I don't think they were uh, in terms of um, what they delivered for their boss, because their boss, Theresa May, wanted containment, and that's what she got didn't work for Northern Ireland, but it worked for the Conservative Party. And so I think that what we have is a change of approach from the Northern Ireland office, much more hands on, much more involved, much more strategic. And I think that that actually, despite what Boris Johnson might might, might say publicly, I think that reflects uh, a serious, a more serious attitude towards Northern Ireland from within the, the British government. Thanks, Alison. Michael, your thoughts. So um, I just want to pick up one point if I quick very quickly Barbara said about the risks of identity and I and I think it's a real issue notwithstanding my optimism it's a real challenge in fact it was brought, brought to me and some of you may have heard this already about early 2017 a Northern Ireland farmer I think from a unionist background asked post Brexit if their cow and its milk could be British Irish or both under the Good Friday Agreement as far as I knew it wasn't in the text but in terms of the spirit of the agreement it would still be possible that 
And now we see this intertwining of identity and economics playing out in the Irish Sea border instead. So I think we have a very complicated arena to navigate here. And it really does come back. And I want to take the per political personality out of it, if I may, into the question of agreements and the question of sticking by agreements. Barbara made the point about American consul's job normally being difficult in relation to uh, jurisdictions not sticking by their agreements about not touching money that shouldn't be theirs. So I think this is fundamental to this question. Agreements. We have agreement. The protocol is an agreement. It's part of a withdrawal agreement. You have an agreement between the EU and the UK. You may or may not have, but you still must have relationships between the US and the UK and the US and the EU. President Biden and, it, in, and his administration is very much an institutional organization. They want an institutional approach. They want to see agreements respected. They want to see them applied and they want to see them adhered to. I have confidence that the British government will do that over time as they work through the immediate difficulties. However, we can't get away also, as I've observed in another context, there is a clash here, a fundamental class, structural clash between the European Union, that is law. The EU is law, the acquis, and the protocol is part of the acquis. The UK no longer is in such a construct. It has no written constitution. It has a sovereign and the power of parliament and the power of prime minister. And there's an inevitable fluidity there of decision making that will come up against the hard and fast rules of the European Union and its more complex decision making processes. And what business and I suppose an investment needs is for a realization of these challenges and for politicians and political processes to work towards resolving them. And again, that's come back to why I brought the USTR in here and I brought the special envoy in here and I brought the opportunity of the US that wants to deal with both and all of them to actually you know, bring people together. I mean, a US voice in a room here makes a difference. A US voice that has the mandate of the US president makes a significant difference. I take Barbara's point about the, I've been lectured for decades by civil servants about not letting the best be the enemy of the good. I've never heard an innovator entrepreneur use that phrase, but nevertheless, I think that there is an opportunity in some way, if you root the, root the envoy's task in the agreement that they can, which, with all its strands, now with its interlinking to the EU as well, that that voice, that position, that opportunity, and that personality can play a role on these islands and also bringing the thing voices back from this island to the president. So the president hears the conversations that are taking place in private as well as in public. Thanks, Michael. So we had a number of, you've been touching on a number of points that a lot of our questioners raised that are kind of a few a little bit skeptical about some of the, the points that you're making. We do have one that broadly supports, a question that broadly supports what you have to say, but offers the thorny question of how. And I would love to hear, maybe I'll address this to Peter and to, to Michael. And it comes from a good friend of ours, the Consul General of Ireland in Chicago, Kevin Byrne. Kevin has this to say. Thank you all for your timely, insightful, and most of all, hopeful perspectives. The figures on the concerns and interests of the people of Northern Ireland are always compelling and often corrective of a prevailing narrative based on constitutional issues. How do you see political discourse moving beyond this constitutional debate and toward those real concerns of the people of Northern Ireland? Peter, Michael, what do you think? Well, first of all, we're not gonna move beyond the constitutional debate because it's too embedded. So therefore, what we would, uh, I suppose, go back to the whole concept of these conversations and the question about uh, the future of the island uh, is what we probably would call for then is how we have those debates in evidence-based ways. So we don't just have this Orwellian two legs good, four legs bad, or four legs good, two legs bad. We don't just do the Northern Ireland's a useless place, terrible place. We don't just have the South of Ireland has all of this poverty and exclusion. And, and you know, so, so how do we actually have a conversation which is first and foremost about building up the economy of Northern Ireland. I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat myself here. The challenge for whether you're a Republican or whether you're a unionist has to be to make Northern Irish society work. So therefore constitutional change is either relegated or constitutional change becomes easier. The fundamental way, first of all, to achieve that is, and this is what was important in the protocol, we can't just protect the North-South dynamic. We have to protect the East-West dynamic. That is our predominant economic relationship. This has been articulated by people who've taken to the street, but it is still our predominant relationship. If you want to maintain stability on this island, it is about the totality of the relationships. Interdependence is not just for North-South. Interdependence is also for East-West. 
And I think that that's what's critically important here is that we understand everything. The, fir the first uh, phrase that Michael used in his presentation, the totality of the relationships are not something that are for us to select. The totality of the relationships are embedded and they're something that we have to live through, react to, and also build and support. Thanks, Michael. Okay, so follow the money. So I could very quickly name serious potential. There's a fund about to be launched called Peace Plus that's a follow on to the uh, peace funds that have been in process that the European Union has been funded and the British government is funding and the Irish government. There's gonna be a Peace Plus fund of 1 billion over five years for cross-border projects, Northern Ireland, the six border counties, and the rest of the island. I know about it, I'm on the committee. It's a really exciting opportunity. Number two, the Department of, of uh, Taoiseach here is a shared island fund worth 500 million, currently over five years. IBEC, the business organization has proposed it should be 5 billion. I personally think it should be 10 billion, but they thought that might be a bit much finding ways to spend the money, actually, if we had 10 billion. There are the city deals in Northern Ireland already in Derry. Uh, they're talking with Donegal County Council as regards how that could be done for the benefit of the Northwest between the two jurisdictions, the Northwest growth region. There's no account, there's no counting yet of the private sector investment that will go into the climate actions, particularly the energy renewal projects and all the other agri-food developments that are going to respond to the post-COVID scenario and the other changes in the global economy that are being driven by the new realities that we all have to contend with. Now, there's a choice for politicians and political processes. They can put obstacles in the way of that investment being done efficiently and effectively on the island, or they can go with the flow of that investment, not threatening anyone's constitutional position because all of that is worked out and guaranteed within the Good Friday Agreement, and they can facilitate those investments in a positive and progressive ways for employment, for education, et cetera. And picking up Barbara's point about third level education, if you go back to my point, that table about Northern Ireland, the catch up it has to do, and it's a really important point in terms of its level of third level uh, participation, that again would catapult the island of Ireland right to the front of the European League table in terms of the highly educated workforce that, 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 that is the potential. I remember listening to the head of the OECD, who is the former uh, finance minister in Mexico, who went through a, a fossil fuel crash there when he was asked in the middle of our crash, could he see Ireland's recovery? And he said, yes, because Ireland's economy is based on people and people can learn how to do things differently and get ahead again. Thank you, Michael. Okay, the next question I would like to pose to Alison and then to Barbara. It has to do with this. We've we've talked a lot about sort of like the trends and the processes, and you would both agree that these are kind of, if you will, positive and kind of are defined by progress. Allison, you suggested that Brexit kind of threw a spanner into things, and the protocol, of course, the way that has played out has been a spanner too. But there's also even shorter term contingencies that are, if you will, sort of like politicized by things like Brexit and the protocol. And we've seen a number of them lately. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on how you think these are going to complicate the process and maybe pull out your crystal ball and say kind of how things are going to play out. The first, of course, is what our questioner calls the civil war within the DUP. And the second is then the Irish Language Act and the role that it's playing in sort of like this broader story of long term trends and of kind of medium term and short term contingencies. How do you see these sorts of things affecting what's going to be happening in the north? Alison and then Barbara. I get to be positive again. Um, civil war in the DUP, I think is a really good thing. This is the DUP starting to move away. It's, it's finally starting to look at where society is moving, about where unionism is moving. Unionism is, uh, uh, the, the, the DUP is, is really unrepresentative of the unionist community now, which is largely progressive is equality based, is pro-rights. And um, I think that what we are seeing in the DUP is a reflection of that. They did have a, a big hiccup um, in the election of Edwin Putz. Um, now with Jeffrey Donaldson coming in, I think that's actually going to push the DUP in a softer direction, which is where they, they, they need to move. In terms of the Irish Language Act, which of course is part of a culture act, um, despite what some people might say, that Culture Act represents a compromise, a compromise that everyone agreed to. 
that can only be good in Northern Ireland, where we constantly have entrenched positions. And quite frankly, what we need with Irish language edu uh, legislation is to get that legislation through and get this issue off the table. It is one of the last barriers between unionism and nationalism that we need to deal with. And I, I welcome it wholeheartedly. Barbara? I am not on the ground. And I'm dealing from seeing it when it poots over the years and knowing Jeffrey Donaldson from years ago, but I actually find that everything Allison said, I would just associate myself with. I, I think this could be a very, very healthy stepping into a new reality. And so I'm, I, I actually just would just endorse those remarks with the statement that, you know, I'm, I'm a diplomat and I always believe unless you've been on the ground in the last two weeks, you shouldn't comment on such things. But from my vantage point, that sounded absolutely right, Allison. Diplomatically put, Barbara. Okay, so I will put you on the spot then again with what is going to be kind of our last series of questions. And this has to do with the role of the United States. And so, Barbara, if I can pose this question first to you. Um, what tangibly do you think the U.S. can do to support investment? And I'll ask Michael to follow up. And after that, I'll ask the other two panelists to come in and say what they think they should, they think the United States should be doing through all of this. So go ahead, Barbara. And no diplomatic dodge on this one. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just go right to the chase. I don't think what the U.S. government does at a federal level fundamentally is the driver for decisions to invest in Northern Ireland or not. Um, I just don't think that that's what it is. I, I will reiterate that it is a, a remarkable moment where people in an array of absolutely the key positions, especially if you think a free trade agreement is important to future prosperity of Northern Ireland, you could not have ended up with a group of people who are more explicitly committed to the Good Friday Agreement and will keep their eye on Ireland. Um, the final thing I want to say about this, the risk that we've always, we've been lamenting for 10 years is that with changing demographics and with things going as well as they have gone in Northern Ireland, that the U.S. administration would lose interest and in that, you know, days of celebration of St. Patrick's Day where we all focus on this and renew commitments and that that would fail. I do not see that happening through this bumpy patch that we have to navigate. I think it all stays there. All of that helps in a soft way to make um, investment seem like a reasonable proposition on the island of Ireland. But, you know, we don't really, we, we have a more hands-off view in the U.S. about where our foreign direct investment goes. And, you know, what we'll say is go where your contracts are going to be honored and you can make a profit. And I can tell you, your contracts will be honored and you can make a profit when you go to Ireland. And remarkably, when I was Consul General, the State Department gave me permission, the lawyers did, to make a video for Invest Northern Ireland saying that. So we, we do go further out because we're not supposed to be recommending that American capital offshore, but we do for Northern Ireland because we love the place. Thanks, Barbara. Michael, uh, quickly. Quickly, okay, I've divided two types of investment, I suppose, or maybe three very quickly. One is corporate investment, right, which I think federal government, perhaps Barbara, could have a role. I go back to the 95 Clinton Investment Conference. I think it would signal to corporate America that's already invested in the island to think about retention, think about staying, think about building on what they have, okay? I think that has an important contribution to the peace process when the tax issue dials down. Secondly, I think there's funds. Funds in the US could look at opportunities for investment in the island in our infrastructure that has to be developed, that is behind, be it rail, road, transport, energy, whatever. And third, perhaps most importantly, coming back to the existing organizations, relationships. At the end of the day, everything's about relationships. I think the investment the US can make in being a part of the maintenance and constructing of relationships on the island, between the islands, repairing of relationships between the EU and the UK, relationships, transatlantic relationships, I think, as Barbara says, is a unique moment that this group of Irish Americans could lay down real solid foundations for the future America that's a different America and a future Ireland that's a different Ireland, frankly, and will reflect America more perhaps than America understands in terms of its mixed variety of ethnicities, etc., that we can really start this new era of progress together. And last word, Allison and Pete, what should the U.S. do? Very, very briefly. I'll go first. Um, I, I would reiterate what Michael has said. Funds are hugely important. 
um, we, we do need investment um, in things like infrastructure uh, and, and that would be a help. But I also think that America is such a huge global player that the focus from the Biden administration back on Ireland can only be a good thing for us. And final word, Pete. Well, I think when we, we were seen during the conflict and we now have the, the bubbling up of a, being a global place and uh, we'll never have the scale of America, et cetera, but we are a place that is now looking outward. I would actually prefer the answer to the question the other way around. We should be going to America and selling ourselves and selling our case and selling our new society. We shouldn't be expecting other people to pick up the bill and we shouldn't be expecting other people to step in when we've got difficulties. I think the only endurability of interdependence and a new island a new Ireland and a new, a new politics is that very issue. It's when we have moved from that hermetic, hermetically seen society that went through conflict and stand up as a new place with a new identity and a new culture. And we should be selling ourselves to the world, not expecting the world to pick up the bill. Well, it's not a Notre Dame event unless we use a football metaphor. So thank my panelists for kicking us off and kicking off this transatlantic series. I thought that uh, lots of the discussions were very, very helpful in kind of allowing us to make our way through these various thickets. It's one set of perspectives, but we're going to be hearing other perspectives. And on that, I hope that our audience can join us for the next two. We are on uh, June 29th at 12 o'clock Eastern time in the United States. Minister of Foreign Affairs Simon Coveney will be joining us to present the Irish perspective. And on the 30th of June, the following day at noon here in, in the uh, Eastern United States, the UK Secretary of State Brandon Lewis will discuss the UK perspective. Let me thank all of you for attending and most especially thank my panelists for the time and effort that they put into this. I think we're off to a wonderful start. Be well, everyone.